Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Broccoli. I'm co-director of the Rutgers Climate Institute, and I'd like to welcome all of you to this year's Rutgers Climate Symposium. I hope all of you are healthy and safe. This is the 10th year that the Climate Institute has sponsored this event, and today's theme is Public Universities and Transformative Climate Action for a Just Recovery. To begin today's symposium, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Holloway, who earlier this year became the 21st president of Rutgers University. President Holloway, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna begin with an apology to all of you. Uh, as it, you may not know this, but new presidents have to go to class as well. At this literal same moment as this conference is kicking off, uh, there is a seminar for 52 uh, new college presidents, and, uh, university and college presidents. Uh, so I'll be a little bit late to that, but there is no way that I was gonna miss at least popping in to say hello and to do what little I could to get this um, really important conference moving. I don't have to tell all of you or any of you that we are at a historic moment with intersecting crisis in this country, in this world, the COVID pandemic, and its effect on our, on our economy, among other things, a racial reckoning that is not just national to us, but global, and climate change, which is, of course, every one of us. Public universities have a tremendous role to play in addressing these issues through research, through teaching, public engagement, locally, nationally, and globally. And I also think public universities lead by example. Rutgers has taken many substantial steps long before I got here, which makes me very happy, taking these steps to reduce our carbon emissions, to cite just one example, installing the nation's largest campus solar facility at the time it was built in 2013. Last year, my predecessor, Bob Barchi, established the President Task Force, President's Task Force on Carbon Neutrality and Climate Resilience. He recognized, as do I, the need to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions. This past July, despite all of the pandemic challenges, the task force released an interim report. It's the product of seven working groups from across all our campuses as they work toward creating a climate action plan for Rutgers by mid 2021. The task force is looking both inward and outward as it elevates climate solutions. Not only is uh, the resilience and preparedness of our university that we need to be studying and advocating towards, but also that of our surrounding communities. It looks to the task force is looking inward and outward in evaluating climate positive economic development and how our efforts can align with state policies for the broader economy. The task force is asking how equity considerations need to be addressed in evaluating potential solutions. This year, Rutgers joined the University Climate Change Coalition, UC3, an alliance of 22 leading North American research universities focused on this vital mission. UC3 members collaborate as they help their communities reach climate goals, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and nurture climate resilience. Today's symposium is intended to frame a dialogue that is both scholarly and publicly accessible. We're asking, how can leading institutions of higher education move us toward a net zero world and toward more resilient communities? But that's not all. And for me, this really does resonate very loudly. We're asking, how can all of this important work be done in a just and equitable manner while we recover from this pandemic? In other words, returning to the way I opened my comments here, how can, we, how can we respond responsibly and fairly to all three crises at the same time? I don't have the answer to that question, and I'm hoping that in the course of this um, conference with the amazing speakers we have lined up, that we might start moving towards some answers to those questions but we must answer all these questions at the same time. This is really hard work, but as I've said often when confronting hard work and it all feels like it's been hard in 2020, if a university isn't prepared to do hard work, I don't know what we are functioning for. I mean, what, what is our function if we aren't prepared to do hard work? Rutgers, I believe is ready to do that work. I'm certainly ready to do that work. And as I told a, a group of, um, undergraduate uh, individuals who were involved in a uh, 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 global justice initiative at the university. I confess, I forget the name of the group. This is in my, I think, second week on the job. 
uh, as they presented their list of issues that they needed to talk about with me and try to urge me along the path, I told them, I read the memo, I'm on board, let's find a way to do that work together. So as I tell, as I told them, I tell you, I've read the memo, figuratively speaking, I understand uh, the incredible challenges that are ahead of us, but I'm on board. I fully support this work. Thank you for taking part today. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words and for giving me the opportunity to let you know how much I support all of this incredible work. I wish I could be here to see, uh, to listen to the panelists and to hear the debates and, and actually hear some answers to questions that we need to have. Sadly, I've got to go to class. Thanks again for your time. I look forward to getting an update on this and then to working together when the Climate Task Force report comes, comes uh, lands on my desk in the middle of 2021. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, President Holloway, for taking the time to join us this morning. Next, I'd like to welcome Laura Lawson, who serves as Interim Executive Dean of the Rutgers School of Environmental and Biological Sciences and Interim Executive Director of the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Laura. Thank you, Tony. And, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Rutgers Climate Symposium. The work of the faculty, staff, and students at our School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, like the work of many of you, including our colleagues and our peers from other institutions who've joined us today, is critical in understanding how the climate system has been changing and how, and how it is projected to change. Further, we work to understand just what these profound changes mean to terrestrial, aquatic, and marine systems, food systems, our health, infrastructure, our economies, and our communities. It is critical that we support research to address greenhouse gas emission reductions, as well as to adapt to these changes. And of course, it is critical that we educate students to take, to take us into a future where we can realize the net zero greenhouse gas emissions over the next several decades that is needed to avoid the most serious consequences of climate change. As the land grant institution of the state of New Jersey, our mission is to closely link our research to our extension and outreach programs to take our knowledge and to deliver it to society. I look forward to hearing today's speakers help us probe how we as members of a public institution can enhance our work together towards solutions to address the very real challenges of global climate change in our communities. So thank you and I really look forward to today. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, pleasure to have you here this morning. And uh, we thank you for your support of the Rutgers Climate Institute. I would also like to thank another supporter of the Rutgers Climate Institute, Peter March, Executive Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and uh, invite Dean March to join us now. Peter. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the School of Arts and Sciences, uh, it's also my pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, symposium. Climate change affects every facet of our society, every place on earth. Understanding the causes, the consequences, and solutions requires scholarly contributions, collaborations that intersect many parts of our society and our environment. Rutgers Climate Institute is just such a model for uh, cross-disciplinary uh, collaboration with more than 100 affiliate faculty from 16 schools across Rutgers University. These affiliates represent the natural sciences, the social sciences, and humanities, uh, as well as law, medicine, business, and engineering. So it's, it's really a uh, broad spectrum. The Institute's mission um, to facilitate interdisciplinary scholarship, education, and outreach on climate change while supporting initiatives to collaborate and to practically apply our expertise to address climate change across our region. Rutgers has been hosting an annual climate change symposium um, since 2006 with a goal to share knowledge, to foster collaboration among researchers and students, all of whom are interested in climate change across many, many disciplines. In this unprecedented year, we cannot be together in person, but I'm very grateful to be able to share today's discussion with you, even if it's remote, and with a very diverse audience that's participating virtually, including academics from many institutions, many disciplines, citizens, community leaders, and many of you who are affiliated with public, private, and non-governmental organizations. 
So thank you to all the speakers and all the attendees for taking time to have this important cross-sector dialogue. I encourage all listeners to put their thoughts into the chat box as your thoughts are important to all of us and we will share them with our speakers as well. Please be sure of that. So with that, let me turn it back um, to Tony and, and welcome again, everyone. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, if this were not a virtual symposium, this would be the time when I'd be telling you about logistics, where you could get lunch, where the restrooms are. So I guess that's one thing that uh, doing this in cyberspace has made a, a little bit simpler. But there are some things that I do want to share with you before we get started. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the late Frank Spasato. Frank was an economics major and a member of the Rutgers College graduating class of 1973. And his generous memorial endowment has underwritten today's symposium. We also have a planning committee that was involved in developing the agenda for today's symposium. And I'd like to thank them as well. The planning committee includes my Rutgers Climate Institute co-director, Robin Lyshenko, as well as Marjorie Kaplan, associate director of the Rutgers Climate Institute, Kevin Lyons of the Department of Supply Chain Management, Angela Oberg of the Department of Human Ecology. And another member of the planning committee is the moderator of our first panel, my colleague, Robert Kopp of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So at this point, I invite Bob to turn on his camera and microphone and get the discussion underway. Bob. Thank you, Tony. And good morning. Um, so today we're very fortunate to have brought together an eminent group of scholars and scholar practitioners for both of our panels. Um, so the way this is going to work is that each of our plenary panelists will provide some remarks. And after all three have spoken, we'll have a, a short discussion. We hope to have some time for a few questions as well. So please feel free to type your questions into the chat box um, and they'll be collected uh, if time allows. The first panel brings together three distinguished academic leaders, all past or current deans, to share their thoughts on the role of higher education in achieving uh, societal transformation and climate action. Rutgers uh, has, um, Dean Lawson mentioned is a land grant university. And while there are certainly problematic aspects to the land grant history, um, I think there's also much we can learn about the role of universities in societal change from that history, which began during the civil war and is deeply rooted in what was at the time a revolutionary commitment to democratizing knowledge and advancing social welfare. So I'm very pleased that our first panelist is one of the leading scholars of the land grant experience. Stephen Gavazzi is Dean Emeritus at Ohio State University Mansfield and is a professor of human development and family science in the College of Education and Human Ecology at the Ohio State University. He's going to speak on the role of land grant universities in listening to citizens and responding to community needs. Stephen, I invite you to turn on your camera, unmute yourself, share your screen and begin your remarks. All right. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate the introduction and thanks to everyone for this opportunity to talk about the, the role of land grant universities. Uh, I am going to uh, speak on a number of different topics today that do concern uh, land grant universities. Uh, as Bob mentioned, and also even uh, Laura Lawson in her introduction noted that Rutgers is of course a land grant university as there are 110 land grant universities across the country and actually around the world in US territories. I call myself land grant fierce. And the reason that I do that is because I'm really looking to help people to understand that there is in fact something that is very special about the land grant universities and the system that has been created. The idea of land grant fierce simply means that there is a way of differentiating the role, the three part mission really that land grant universities have to teach, to do research and to connect with communities and engage with them through their cooperative extension services in ways in which many other public and private universities cannot do. In, in many ways, I'm gonna be talking about this book that came out in 2018 uh, called Land Grant Universities for the Future, Higher Education for the Public Good, which I wrote with West Virginia University President Gordon Gee. 
in that book, there were many different things that we had uncovered through interviews that we had done with land grant university presidents and chancellors. Uh, these seven main themes that you see up on your screen right now were the themes that were generated from a content analysis of these interviews that we had done. And then we also did approximately 35 additional interviews with uh, other folks in higher education, uh, faculty who study higher education issues, but also governors, uh, state legislators, and policymakers to, in some ways, ground truth what it was that these presidents and chancellors were saying about the main themes that land-grant universities were facing. Uh, an even casual look at this list would indicate that uh, these are not just land-grant issues, but rather uh, probably can be looked at uh, in terms of all public universities, and, and I dare say even many of the private universities. I'm not going to go through these seven main themes, but rather I'm going to go next to what President Yee and I had developed out of those themes, which is what we call this formula for higher education success. And uh, in essence, as you can see, this is an additive formula which gets us down to the bottom, which says that there, if these things are done by public and land grant universities, it will increase the return on investment for public higher education as a whole. So this first point about greater efficiency harkens back to this idea of we have been seeing steady declines in the amount of state funding that has occurred. And now with the COVID pandemic, we will probably be facing even greater cuts to those uh, to the state subsidies that, that uh, all uh, land grant and public universities get. So it's this idea of now being more efficient with the money that we are being given. And this is clearly something that the presidents and chancellors were very much aware of, as were other higher education leaders. Uh, the three-part mission of the land grant university, teaching research and service to the community or engagement, uh, there needs to be a greater balance there. Unfortunately, for many universities, and especially many of the high-profile land-grant universities, research has become the coin of the realm, and in fact has been unduly rewarded, leaving teaching excellence and engagement excellence behind. So there has been a, a real call to rebalance uh, that formula. Uh, and when universities do engage in research, they had best uh, look at the applied component of this. Obviously, everyone knows we need both basic and applied research, but the public really clamors for an understanding of how their tax dollars are being used in ways which solve the current issues and concerns of the communities that these universities have been designed to serve. Uh, being accessible and affordable, that, that sounds really wonderful. Everyone should do that. But we juxtapose that against what universities have oftentimes been guilty of doing, which is chasing national rankings at the expense of accessibility and affordability. This next piece about being community focused is a, an attempt to transcend this idea of should universities engage more with rural or urban uh, uh, constituencies. Uh, land grant universities were formed at a time in which 90, well, I'm sorry, that was a little bit of an exaggeration, at least 80% of the population was more rurally located in terms of their residents. Uh, with about 20% in, in uh, urban populations. Now, fast forward to today, and we see exactly the opposite, that approximately 80% of our country lives in a more urbanized area with less than 20% now in a, in, a, in a rural area. What does that mean? It means that simply we should be community focused and focused on all communities, regardless of whether or not they are more rural or more urban in orientation. And then finally, this idea of closer to home impact uh, again, over the last two decades especially, there has been an enormous push to globalize our universities to create more international connections. All of that is well and good. At the same time, though, we have to continue to be able to translate that information back to how does this impact the folks who are paying our bills. So, Again, as I noted, these were all uh, themes that came out of the interviews that we did with uh, land grant presidents and chancellors. What we decided to do, Gordon he and I decided to do for our next book, which will be out early next year. Uh, and that book is called What's Public About Public Higher Ed. Again, another uh, book that will be coming out from Johns Hopkins University Press. And you see the subtitle here, Halting Higher Education's Decline 
in the court of public opinion. It has certainly been President Yee's, in my opinion, that the uh, profile of universities, especially public universities, continues to de deteriorate. Uh, and, and we see that through many uh, different polls and surveys that have been done, including most recently the Pew Char Charitable Trust Survey, which showed that there were actually also some very large political differences in that Republican uh, leaning uh, citizens, more so than Democratic uh, leaning citizens, tend to see higher education in a much more negative light. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to test out the themes that we had. And instead of asking university presidents and chancellors what their opinions were, we decided to go to the citizens themselves. The main point of our book actually harkens back to President Abraham Lincoln with the uh, quote that actually came from his first public debate with Stephen Douglas. And he said, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. So we wanted to find out what the public thought about higher education. So we took those seven themes and we fashioned them into largely seven items that we then posed to over 1,000 citizens across the United States. What we found uh, and what we will be reporting next year in this book is that many of the themes mm -hmm. that the university presidents and uh, chancellors had indicated were in fact replicated. Uh, so in other words, they did have a good pulse uh, on what the, the public was thinking. However, there were three new themes that emerged. We don't have a lot of time to spend, but these are things that you probably would imagine the public would be thinking about. The role of college sports, uh, also the political cli climate on campus and the divisiveness that comes from what, what's been happening regarding free speech issues. And then also how universities communicate with the public in terms of what they're actually doing for the public. Now, those results all happened before the pandemic. So what I then did was I created a second national survey. And this was most recently reported in a Forbes article that I did called Have Public Universities Failed Their Communities on COVID-19 and Racism? And what I did was I put two extra questions to the citizens. We went to over 5,000 citizens across the country and we asked them, how well are universities doing in terms of their response to both COVID-19 and social justice issues when it came to your public universities. Interestingly, in replicating some of those uh, surveys that I talked about before, we saw that significantly more Democrats held positive opinions in comparison to Republican citizens. And again, as you might expect, uh, just as with the other surveys out there, independents fall somewhere in the middle. The most important point though, the, the, the piece that I would really like to emphasize in closing here is that between 35 and 40% of all citizens had yet to have made up their minds about the positive or negative impact that their public universities had on community needs as related to both COVID-19 and social justice issues. So the bottom line here, as we say in the book, power resides in the will of the people, or again, for higher education, we will ignore public opinion at our own peril. So perhaps, and I've put this to the panelists today, maybe we should be doing a third national survey on climate issues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present these ideas today. And I look forward to the conversation throughout the rest of this conference. Great. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for that enlightening talk. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite Lisa Gromlick, who is the inaugural dean, uh, has been uh, and a great leader for that school since it was founded about a decade ago of the College of the Environment at the University of Washington, um, and as well as a professor in the school. Um, and Dean Gromlich is going to speak on the role of higher education in transformative climate action. Thank you, Robert. And it's truly an honor to be here and to be part of this symposium. This moment as awful as it is, is the moment I've been waiting for for my entire career. I'm been studying climate and climate change since the 1970s. I've been particularly focused on the mountains of the world, but particularly those in Western North America. And last century, way back when, you know, we started to talk about what the trends in declining snowpack and increased frequency of drought might mean for the potential for wildfires to engulf our ecosystems in the West. 
And we thought it would happen somewhere around the 1930s. Well, it's happening. And so the awfulness of the moment is that all of those forecasts that we made are now happening. And so it's here and people are paying attention. People are hungry for solutions. And some would argue that like the timing is terrible because we've got COVID and we've got racial reckoning and business as usual doesn't exist. I mean, if anybody talks about business as usual and being on the horizon, we kind of look at them like, you know, are you crazy? Um, we're in the midst of deep unemployment and small businesses struggling to, to stay open. And all of this raises the question that you have put before us, which is how does higher education respond? How do we take our capacity to generate new knowledge and be part of solutions to the grandest of these grand challenges? And I would argue this is not a academic question. We really have to show up here. And particularly for public universities, for land grant universities, we have no choice. So in my brief remarks, um, I wanna talk about two, three elements of this. One is how we embrace this urgency. Second, what really makes a solution? And third, how do we build trusted relationships? So first, I don't need to tell you, but in convening us, I will remind us that climate change is here now. We are all affected. No one's okay. I described how being from Seattle, we were engulfed in smoke from bigger fires, more intense fires, more frequent fires than we have seen in decades. There used to be a fire seasons. Fires burned in July and August. They burn all year round now. Like you, my colleagues at Rutgers, we're, we're a coastal university. We, sea level rise is accelerating and it's posing real risks to coastal cities. Storm surges are boosted by higher seas and they're causing unprecedented damages. Seawater's now in the drinking water in, in many of our cities. Once again, being so close to the marine economy here in Seattle and knowing that I'm at Rutgers, I simply need to say that oceans are part of the problem in terms of CO2 as well. They're becoming more acidic as they absorb excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we know that in more acidic waters, it's difficult for hard shelled organisms, our shellfish, our, our corals to construct their shells. These have impacts that are already being impacting the oyster industry in my home in Seattle, and they will become much more severe. So clearly we're here because we're looking for solutions. And what's crazy is solutions are here now. I, I look around the people that are associated with the Rutgers Climate Institution, uh, Institute and you've got amazing people Robert, who's moderating, you know, Tony Broccoli, who you heard from. Um, we're going to hear from Gene Herb and Kevin Lyons. Robin Lachenko is here as well. You have, you are working on solutions. If you're not working on them, you're probably helping somebody or you're going out to lunch back in the old days with them or they're across the campus. It's here. Um, in anticipating this talk, I got on the Climate Institute website and um, there's a report just out, an amazing report on integrating the needs and challenges of underrepresented, underrepresented and socially vulnerable populations into coastal hazards planning in New Jersey. And if I have a Zoom wizard, they're gonna put that in the chat, the link to that, because it's an incredible report. Um, at the national level, I'm such a fan of Project Drawdown, a hundred solutions that everyone can embrace now. But, you know, I'm a scientist. I don't develop solutions myself. I just talk about solutions. <laughs> I was really caught off guard when a social science colleague of mine, Kiki Jenkins, now at Arizona State University, put up a slide one time in a talk that said, a solution is only a solution if people use it. And it literally like, I just like stopped on my tracks. Um, and Kiki went on to, as others do, explain why solutions 
absolutely need to be culturally appropriate. They need to be legitimate. They need to come out of an inclusive and trusted process. And so in our current situation, trust is key and trust only comes if in fact with our stakeholders, we have a clear eyed embrace of the complexity that we're talking about. The current global unraveling has shown us that these systems are all interconnected and solutions must address these intertwined systems. They must deal with the complexity. They must deal with the contingency and rebuilding our collective lives post pandemic and in the midst of the climate crisis requires attending to all of these, not the least of which is racial justice. So my third point is to expand on this idea about trust. So innovation diffusion, getting the solutions out of higher education and into the hands of, so that they are used by real people, agencies, institutions, communities, critically is linked to this notion of trust and legitimacy. So we must, in a world of compound risks, we must, to be trusted, talk about compound solutions. So I'm gonna, I clearly like this report. I'm gonna give you like the one sentence quote from it. It was one of my favorite quotes. So the, the quote is, changing policies and systems to ensure that socially vulnerable populations are proactively, underscore, my underscore, proactively engaged as part of state and local coastal resilience programs, planning and policy development, and to ensure that socially vulnerable populations have the full capacity that they need to meaningful participate in such efforts is critical. This is not rocket science. This is harder than rocket science. And this is gonna take all of us in higher education pulling together to do this work. I congratulate Rutgers on building on your land grant history and with the work of the Rutgers Climate Institute convening us like this. And I want to say that all of us in this, I can see on my, like there's 220 of us here, that our, all of our engagement is critical to change the culture of higher education. It is on us. It's on deans, it's on every single one of us. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lisa, for that uh, stirring talk. I'm now delighted to invite our third panelist, uh, Professor Rina, Rosina Bierbaum, who is the Dean Emerita at the University of Michigan um, and Roy Weston Chair in Natural Economics at the University of Maryland. Um, Professor Bierbaum is also um, had the opportunity in her in her career to have taken on leadership roles in places like the White House Office of Science and Technology um, Policy, um, and is going to speak on graduate training to bridge the science practitioner divide. Uh, so, Rosina, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Rob, and thanks also to Margie and Tony for planning this. And I'm really pleased to join the stage with Stephen and Lisa. Um, I'm supposed to talk about graduate training, but I think it's incredibly important to enable that graduate training, which I believe has to start at the top that, so that we are able to tackle the climate crisis, as one of you has already put into the chat. Um, I hope many of you listening may want to have similar experiences to me serving in a practitioner world, such as in the government, um, and also bridge the university research setting. Boy, bridging that practitioner research divide to produce usable information is more difficult than it ought to be. Um, from the academic side, we want to be exhaustive and we're more comfortable with numbers and percentages and seeming precision and accuracy. But from the practitioner side, we need to identify best practices and actions we can do now, even while we're figuring out the missing research answers for future questions. And we've got to translate that, as you've heard from the previous speakers. So I don't want to go too much into this. On the left here, I'm showing you that universities have been long partners. We've already heard this. Um, but in addition to land grant universities, of which Maryland is one, there are also sea grant universities. Um, and both of my universities are sea grant. 
Um, the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments, the NOAA RESA programs, have been around for 20 years that have helped expand and build the nation's capacity to cope with climate variability and change in concert with universities. So there's 10 of these RESAs, and Michigan has the Great Lakes one. And then, of course, university researchers have been providing technical assistance to climate mitigation and adaptation assessments and reports from local to international, from the U.S. National Climate Assessment to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to the recently formed Global Commission on Adaptation. There are so many opportunities for universities to help bolster areas that need bolstering and in times when the federal government may not have been doing all that it could do to advance knowledge. On the right, you see several models or ways that universities engage. We know we can amplify key research findings. Really important, we can be at universities neutral facilitators so that we can convene I would say cross-sector conversations that might not be able to be convened anywhere else between business, NGOs, and governments. They may not happen, but we're safe places to do that. We clearly can serve as technical experts with our data and research and analysis. Universities can truly be leaders as in setting carbon neutrality, but also in participating in the design and then implementation of projects that will advance policy management or technology. Many of us work with the communities um, and we can use our campuses as kind of living labs with collaborative projects that cross disciplinary boundaries to find solutions. And of course, very importantly, um, universities can change how their endowments are invested to focus on specific issues. But I want to run through four areas that I think all research institutions, all universities, all public universities should think about. And one, and these all involve students. Um, so first, convening and engaging communities from my two universities. And that's kind of the bottom up where faculty, researchers, and staff can take the initiative to harness the neutral position of universities and extend their research further and engage diverse sets of communities and stakeholders from local to state governments to nonprofits to industry and more. And then forge new possible feasible ambitious climate solutions that, as Lisa said, people might really want to implement. Then I'll just mention some new modes that I think will really help generate, give us the next generation of systems thinkers and civic scientists from our students. And then I want to suggest some institutional levers that can be pulled from the top down to incentivize these engagements and scale these actions to a broader level beyond the too few faculty, alas, who see areas like public service as an automatic component of their duty as part of a university. You know, universities can help make that happen more broadly with praise and with simple incentives. And then lastly, I'll end with an, a, a few areas where I think we need to combine these bottom up and top down approaches to move towards, to move forward audaciously to yield transformative action for just recovery. So first on the research and convenings, here on the left is a list from the UC3, the University Climate Change Coalition of topical areas where we need more work. And on the right is process realms. But note on the left that virtually all sectors of the economy are listed, but the boldest topics are currently receiving more academic attention. There is more happening on technology and the mitigation front than on the adaptation, behavioral, social science front. And if you look on the process side, some areas identified as needing more work are how do you identify all the appropriate stakeholders at multiple stages to formulate the questions that need to be answered and the solutions that are acceptable? That must include the most vulnerable. It has to take stock of culture, of indigenous knowledge, of customs. But we also have to focus attention on how best to communicate and then how we're going to measure success. What does enhancing resilience involve across multiple sectors all at the same time? 
There is a lot that social science can add to our technical and ecological and climate science knowledge. And as we heard in particular, the pace and magnitude of climate change is faster and greater than we thought. And now adaptation therefore really needs to be ramped up. So let me just quickly give you an example of some convenings in my two schools. Now, unfortunately, Maryland is red, Michigan is blue. So where I mean both, I use purple. And I understand these are very awkward colors to use in this season. But um, first, building on Maryland's strength in remote sensing and GIS, they have been helping with land use planning issues from the campus level up to the state level to help to plan and design and implement more green infrastructure and tree cover. Second, both universities have been helping with much needed adaptation plans in cities and states, providing a lot of interesting and important technical information and thinking through options. Um, third, Michigan has helped with where to site wind and solar technologies, uh, where because it's a good place and where because it's also feasible. And also doing things like life cycle analyses of the flows of material and greenhouse gases to figure out the most important intervention points. And then fourth, and very important for our students, both schools are having master's thesis projects in the service of society to solve real world problems. And I think that is a very important trend. In terms of innovative degrees and certificate programs, you know, I think today's students are, are able to think naturally in more systems ways than my generation. And we have got to encourage that. On the left, one third of the master students in my school at Michigan end up doing double masters, dual degrees in three years. They get both degrees and they can walk across both worlds. That really creates problem solvers. And on the right, I think certificate programs that offer say nine to 12 credits for any graduate student in any school or department to become conversant in climate as we're doing in Michigan or in sustainability as we're doing in Maryland is really gaining appropriate interest. Students are really hungry to figure out how to make their research worthwhile. And every one of our students should be able to give a soup to nuts climate talk, starting with science and ending up with solutions and equity. On institutional levers, Maryland on the left, Michigan on the right with solar panels there, um, I would say, universities can appropriately incentivize, recognize, and reward public service and multi-stakeholder engagement and research. You know, we all have three jobs as faculty, research, teaching, and service. And I've read so many university mission statements, and in words, they are serious about service. So our university administrators should be too. University leaderships can meet the faculty, staff, researchers, students halfway by incentivizing collaboration and engagement within their communities to amplify university resources so we can get to viable climate solutions. So we really have to add that and service. So here are six things the presidents, deans, chairs of departments can consider. These are things from a year long study I did for the president of the University of Michigan to increase national science policy engagement. And actually I'm really proud that most of these have been implemented. First, why not require faculty to report annually to their chairs and deans on their community outreach and engagement and what impact that had? Why not give out public service awards to your faculty leaders why not have small pots of seed money to encourage interdisciplinary communities of practice to work on areas of interest? Can you create innovation centers or maybe we call them collaboratories on campus that'll focus on key aspects of climate change? Continue to do real world projects for agencies, cities and businesses and very importantly paid, paid internships for students to work with cities and communities. I just wanna say I worked for the federal government for 20 years and was never ever offered an intern from Ohio State, Michigan, Maryland, Wisconsin, Rutgers, or the University of Washington 
but I was awash in Ivy League intern offers that were very well paid. We got to step up to the plate on this. And let me just end with a few opportunities. Um, given the pace and magnitude of climate change, we got to get on to audacious action together. We need to develop communities of practice for the kinds of intractable problems that have to be tackled by different communities. And I list a number of these here, but they all emanate from the very first one, how to meet the mitigation and adaptation challenge simultaneously, quickly, and find solutions that can be win-win in both of those. Um, underneath, you know, we've got to figure out how to protect people, especially the most vulnerable populations, figure out how to preserve ecosystem services, which are deteriorating rapidly for many reasons, including climate change. And as a university system, conduct the missing research so we have the answers to those questions that we need answered in the coming years. So finally, we must network our networks. Public universities have an incredibly unique role to play to solve big problems and to generate the next group of students who will be the leaders and get us to that sustainable world, the sustainable and just world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rosina. Um, and that's uh, a great kickoff uh, for our discussion. I'd like to invite uh, Dean Gromlich and Professor uh, Gavazzi to turn on their cameras as well and join us uh, for a panel uh, discussion. Um, so let me hear a few things that I heard in those talks. Um, one is that universities are great at producing technical solutions. Um, but as Lisa said, we need not just technical just solutions, technical. but systemic solutions. Um, and we all know that to stabilize the global climate, we need to get to net zero carbon dioxide emissions and sharply reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And to do so, and uh, to get the temperature targets consistent with the Paris Agreement, uh, the next decade needs to be a time of rapidly declining emissions here in the US. Um, Vice President Biden, for example, has laid out a milestone of a carbon neutral electric system by 2035. So let's imagine we make it there in 2035. US has a carbon neutral electric system. We're on track to net zero emissions nationally by 2050. Looking beyond just getting our operational houses in order and decarbonizing our own campus operations. Um, let's take a backward look from 2035 at the previous 15 years. What have public universities done to advance this dramatic and broad scale societal change? And in particular, what did they start doing as we restarted our operations and the economy sort of started picking up after COVID? Um, beyond producing technical solutions and training students, what other activities have we scaled up and what is what was particularly important to do during the restart period um, after this downturn? So um, who would like to go first? Lisa. Happy to, to start this knowing that my fellow panelists will help support other areas. Um, so part, if I can re-engage with this issue of trust, um, the in addition to sort of training this next generation of systems thinkers and having the kind of conversations, for instance, that your president might have with other very high level civic and private sector leaders, there needs to be a boldness with which we as faculty, including early career people, start to develop trusted ongoing relationships with people who are doing some of this most integrative, difficult work. And to do it, we, we don't walk in as like the expert. You know, we walk in with curiosity, humility, and it takes a long time. And once again, you know, sort of note to self as Dean, um, I feel one of the best examples that we were successful in doing this in Washington state around ocean acidification involved three of my senior faculty for two years meeting every other week with a group of stakeholders for two years um, convened by the late Bill Ruckel's house. So with some great leadership at the top, but that, We've got to be ready to roll up our sleeves, not for the one-off PowerPoint at the Rotary lunch, 
but for deep, deep, deep engagement where we understand the problems from other people's points of view. Do you want each of us to answer or do you want to go on, Bob? Yeah, well, why don't we do that? So Rosina, uh, why, why don't you uh, um, go ahead? Well, I, I mean, I guess I would say coming out of the situation we're in, you know, we, we've all, we all feel that we need solutions much faster than we thought we were going to, to multiple climate problems, you know, especially this change in extreme events, which is giving, you know, a year round fire season and a, and, uh, a much more active uh, and intense, um, uh, actually more intense hurricanes and, and lots of droughts and all these things, the plagues happening simultaneously. So I would say, you know, I think all of our universities played a role, a sustained role, which I agree, Lisa, we need um, in previous US national climate assessments. But I would say this next one, which is just getting off the ground and they're looking for authors now, and they're looking at how better to integrate um, across sectors in thinking about both mitigation and adaptation. That's the kind of uh, community that we should be building and maintaining. And there will be regional pieces to this. I hope our universities will each be part of the appropriate regional piece, but we'll also bring together a, a much clearer focus on uh, the issues of justice this time around. Uh, in fact, even unrecognized um, native tribes weren't part of the last one. There is a chapter on native communities, but not unrecognized tribes. So I would say, you know, that's one very tangible thing that requires regional coordination that could definitely access our networks and that can really, if done right, give the U.S. a much better chance to deal with both mitigation and adaptation rapidly to, to make up for the time we've lost in recent years. Stephen. I, I think we really have to change as universities. I think that the key issue, Lisa underscored it in terms of public trust, uh, we cannot continue to do business as usual and assume that everyone is just going to continue to trust us. I think that we have to do many things very differently. Uh, I saw in the chat box, uh, Karen O'Neill had mentioned the, this idea of changing promotion and tenure practices to elevate the idea of uh, excellence in community engagement, something that I've long been uh, a proponent of. These are the kinds of wholesale and very large scale changes that must occur for universities to be able to increase public trust again. So, so maybe let, let me let follow up on, on that point. Let's say we came up with a list of top three policy changes that we could give to President Holloway to implement in the next year to, to help move this along. What, what would be on your top three? And Stephen, maybe you can just follow up on your thoughts and I'll pass it to Rosina. Well, yeah, so first the reward structure, it, ha it has to change. So, and that includes not only how we do promotion and tenure, but also how annual salaries are uh, figured uh, in terms of the formulas that most universities use for, for what uh, constitutes excellence. Right now we know, again, research being the coin of the realm, someone has very large grants and is uh, publishing lots, that is gonna count way more than uh, service to the community or, or excellence in teaching for that matter. So that absolutely has to be rebalanced. And I don't think that that's just a land grant issue either. I think that that has to happen across uh, all, all sectors of higher education. I also think that we need to do a better job of actually supporting outreach and engagement offices. Uh, oftentimes they're, um, they're, they're, they're told that they have this mission and, and it seems so siloed uh, that uh, no, the word just doesn't get out about any kind of important work that's actually being done by universities in terms of the outreach and engagement. And then the last piece, because you only gave me three, I could go on, I could give you 30. But the third one would be to do something about the silos that occur inside of departments and colleges. I think that uh, it's it, we're in the 21st century and we're using an archaic model for collaboration that actually serves as a disincentive. And so I think we need to do something about that. Thanks, uh, Lisa. Yeah, I got three. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Merit and promotion and tenure merit and promotion and tenure, <laughs> merit and promotion and tenure. And here's the deal. And I know we're now up to 203. There are people in this audience right now 
that hear somebody like their dean say, oh yes, you know, this is important. And then at the unit level in their school or department, there are those crusty gatekeepers that are squashing this. And so when President Holloway or President fill in the blank, looks the campus community in the eye and says, this is gonna change right now. It's so powerful and we need that message over and over and over again. Rosina? Yep, so five of my six institutional incentives were in this realm of you know, breaking down the silos, um, valuing uh, outreach and promotion and tenure. And, and I would not underestimate the public service award aspect. We praise members of the National Academies, um, but we should praise people who have been successful in outreach. And one of the questions is, well, how do you measure success in outreach? Um, but, there, but there are ways if you become a source, a resource to media, um, then you are being successful. And we actually now are required to list in our annual reports to the deans um, what we have done, whether it's the Rotary Club or we have spoken to media, uh, and in addition to, yes, I've reviewed 86 journal articles and I've done four in promotion and tenure cases. So I, I think we're zeroing in, you know, it's promotion and tenure, tenure it's breaking down silos, and, and it's publicly valuing that as much as um, research and teaching. Great. So we only have a little bit of time left, so I wanted to pass on one question um, from the chat. Um, which is what do you think the role of alumni should be? So we've, we've, we've taken uh, a very sort of inward focused look to our, our um, like how we restructure ourselves. What, what, how should we be engaging alumni as stakeholders in this transformation? Um, so uh, let's see, we started, Lisa, can you start? You bet. That is a great question. And um, I wanna make a really specific modification of that question which is often our black, indigenous, people of color, alumni don't necessarily feel connected to the kind of alumni engagement campaigns that our universities do. And some very wise people 20 years ago started to, at the University of Washington, to have alumni engagement around communities of color that specifically celebrated their accomplishments and engaged them in ways that had to do with how they wanted to be engaged with. And they have become very powerful advocates for the university. And to be honest, they're on my list of who I call to actually start to get the kind of diverse perspectives that help us inform how we move forward. So yes, alumni, especially those alumni who traditionally might be falling through the cracks, pay attention there. Great, uh, Rosina. Um, I have found that alums are just incredibly eager to help those who are coming behind them. And um, we annually, we used to take people to Washington to meet people from the schools who have had jobs in Washington, but now we have alums who come and talk about the jobs they have, how they've navigated working across environment, policy, engagement, communities. Um, and so that's one, you know, really keep a strong connection between the alums and the current students and they can really help each other. But second, involve your alums in deans and chairs advisory panels to give advice on how the job market is changing, how the skill sets they got may or may not serve the changing um, world out there. And, and I think alums are very eager to give back to the next generation of students and very eager to give back to their own schools. And I think that's the easiest way to engage them and it's one of the most impactful for the students. And Stephen. I think in order to create effective alumni as advocates for universities, we have to give them the tools before they graduate. And I'm gonna speak very specifically first to land grant universities. Land grant universities graduate 1.1 million undergraduates a year. And I suggest that the vast majority of them never have a course on the land grant university mission. Uh, that's changing. We're doing that here at Ohio State. There's also through Gordon Gee, 
West Virginia University has started a course. Uh, we also know that there are courses being done at LSU and the University of Missouri. So these are examples of where when it's land grant specific issues, uh, you, you, you can't blame students for not being good advocates for the land grant mission if they don't know what it means. And then I think in a larger context and talking about climate catastrophe, which is what we're doing today, I think we have to do some empowerment of students before they leave on these kinds of issues as well, if we expect them to be the kind of advocates we need them to be. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we're, we're out of time. So I wanted to thank uh, Professor Gavazzi, Dean Gromlick, and uh, for, uh, Professor Bierbaum for their inspired thoughts and very motivating. I hope we can take some of this uh, with us as Kevin and I uh, continue to, to lead the, the Climate Action Task Force um, for the university. I also want to thank all of the people who've contributed their thoughts um, in the chat box. I'm sorry we didn't have a time to get to all the questions, but we will capture those uh, and, and make sure that we have a time to, to review them as well. Um, so we're going to have a short break uh, before we go to the second half of our program where we're going to hear some more um, sort of on the ground stories of community, um, community university engagement around uh, climate and societal action. Um, so we'll take, as I said, we'll take a short break and begin the second half of our program at 12.15 Eastern time. So thank you all for joining us. Welcome back. I'd like to introduce Dr. Robin Leshenko, professor and chair of the Department of Geography, and also my colleague and co-director of the Rutgers Climate Institute. Robin will moderate this afternoon's panel. Robin. Hey everyone, it's great to, it's great to be here and we had such a wonderful and sort of stimulating set of speakers this morning and I think we're all you know happy and looking forward to hearing our second part of the day now um, what the this afternoon's panel is going to do is to really kind of take a deeper dive into thinking about transformative action kind of going from the really big picture which we heard in the first half of the session to some more granular ideas and solutions. Um, so again, we have three wonderful speakers. Each of our speakers is gonna provide some remarks and then we'll follow up with a similar kind of panel discussion. And then hopefully some, we'll get to some comments in the chat. Um, so with that, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Kevin Lyons. Kevin is professor in the Department of Supply Chain Management at Rutgers, and he'll be speaking on building building capacity for transformative climate action. So Kevin, we would be delighted if you can turn on your camera and start sharing your screen. Okay, are we good? Good afternoon, everyone. Kevin Lyons here from the Rutgers Business School Supply Chain Management. I'm gonna spend my short time talking about some of the actions that we've taken uh, as a university related to operations uh, and some of my research that looks at the community. Now on my first slide, I have two pictures up at the top, uh, the Rutgers Biological uh, Health Sciences, which is on the left in Camden campus. The reason is I'm not gonna talk about them today. I'm gonna talk about Newark and New Brunswick uh, as part of my talk. So I just wanted to make sure that I was inclusive. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is knowing your campus. Uh, before you get started with a lot of these aggressive programs, you need to understand what is going on on your campus. So one of the biggest uh, projects that we have going now, of course, is our climate action plan uh, led by Bob Kopp and I'm one of the co-chairs that we're looking at this assessment of the university. We're a year into this assessment with the report finalized in June, uh, 2021. Um, but understanding the baseline of the university our emissions, uh, potential climate solutions, and assessing the climate solutions. Now, the good news is that Rutgers is already uh, going down this path uh, with a lot of its uh, collection of data and what we're doing on campus. So below are some of the examples of the actions that the university has taken uh, to start to move there. Now, I'm obviously not gonna be able to cover everything such as our dining services, which is doing an, an exceptional job uh, as uh, we deal with food and food waste, uh, housing, and some of the other operations, but these are the types of things that our students, faculty, staff, 
uh, alumni need to know and get involved with in order for us to do this right. So on my side, I look at business. I look at business and sustainability and how those two are integrated. So supply chain management, if you do it right, has a design for the environment mindset where we can reduce energy and water consumption, improve resource efficiency, and then as you move through the supply chain, if you're going from raw materials, hopefully extracted in an environmentally responsible way, there's ways to reduce waste water. Uh, but the thing that I'm focusing on a lot more in my research is the environmental health uh, aspects of business. Um, what are we doing as far as the economy and the people who are part of the supply chain and protect their health? So that's gonna come up a little bit later in my presentation. So the other thing that we can do is obviously use our campuses as living labs. I'm gonna pick on Livingston campus for this uh, presentation. So this is the current state of uh, one of our campuses, Livingston campus, where all the activities that we wanna demonstrate are starting to come together. Geothermal, solar panels, one of the largest solar panel parking systems uh, developed at the time in 2012, 2013. Uh, which provides about 40% of the electrical needs of this campus. Um, ecological preserves that are right handy and close to, to, in this case, the business school. We have an entryway, which is the middle picture uh, that's right off the business school to get, bring the campus a lot closer uh, to nature. So I'm going to switch now to uh, the Newark campus, where the combination of the community and the university become part of the living learning experience, not only for my research, but for the students who work with me. Uh, the Newark campus, along with its partners in the city, have developed a program that's called a Newark 2020, which is buy, live, hire local. My part of that project, which is taking me off campus, this is the applied part of my research, is to bring the entirety of all the anchor institutions that reside in Newark closer to the, uh, the community. And so, so with that, I'm focusing on the local sourcing of goods and services in order to beef up the economy, tighten up our supply chain, and thereby reducing the environmental impacts of goods and services coming from all, all over the place. Uh, so this is our biggest, probably our most involved project to date on the campus. And it's got the signature of our campus uh, chancellor who heads up a lot of these uh, activities on campus which makes it a lot easier for us to do the things that we do. So we look at ourselves as being uh, in the area of influence. So my students and I spent a considerable amount of time out in the field collecting data on our community. Uh, we have one of the largest databases of all the community uh, engaged players and all of our suppliers and businesses that are in Newark, all of our diverse and women owned businesses that reside in order for us to understand who they are and who we need to engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. So we go from the left of the screen, here are our inputs, which is we want to engage with you. We want to have Rutgers, the hospital systems, Prudential, Panasonic, United Airlines, Audible, our entertainment and library systems. And those are just a handful of the 32 anchor institutions that are in Newark completely engaged with sourcing goods and services from the local community. So the next slide I'm gonna show you is just a simulation of a dashboard that I created for this engagement. So what I'm gonna pick on today is our hospital system and uh, the idea that they need to have um, textiles and textiles which are sustainable uh, in their supply chain. So currently the system will look at who are they currently conducting business with in the community? And then the system will automatically uh, tell them or look at where else are you getting your source of materials? And when you put an ecological footprint to this, um, they're basically spending a lot of money outside of Newark, but also with the transportation and the movement of materials back and forth are creating a, uh, a burden to the environment. So what the system will do is identify uh, opportunities first in New Jersey and then what's available right in your backyard. And, uh, and this is all happening in real time. 
the dashboard that we created has identified, uh, in this case, nine diverse, uh, three of them women owned, the other uh, six uh, minority owned firms that can provide you that same service locally at a competitive price and to tighten up your supply chain. And so with this information, they were able to make the, the change and now are doing business uh, local. And with the latest rendition uh, of this system that I put together, it's also calculating the carbon impact of those decisions as well. So this is all in real time. And just one quick story before I head to my last slide. Um, with this, we're able to uh, get into our local businesses, provide them opportunities, allow them to grow. In this particular case, especially during the pandemic, being able to get a, a local manufacturer to manufacture goods uh, directly uh, to the, uh, the community. And so my last slide is we have some challenges, of course, but the competencies needed to do this are there. We know all about life cycle assessment, carbon management, and how to actually do business in a proper way. But when you're hyper-focused on the community, uh, you can be inclusive and, uh, and to actually bring this to action and make it happen. So with that, I conclude. All right, great, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. That was a great talk. And I'm just fascinated by that dashboard. I, I love that. And I wish I had that for many, many of the products that, that we buy, even you know in our daily lives. Let me just very briefly introduce Jeannie before she jumps on. So Jeannie is Executive Director of the Environmental Analysis and Communications Group at the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy here at Rutgers. She's also the co-director of the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center. And Jeannie will be speaking on translational and transactional multi-sectoral engagement with stakeholders. All right, thank you, Jeannie. Thank, thank you so much, Robin, and I didn't pick that title. Um, <laughs> so I'm so glad to be here with everyone today. Um, and um, I feel that um, the talk that we had this morning, the panelists really highlight um, what, I, it helps me understand why I was invited to talk. Cause I'm gonna talk to you about a particular model that this university has been involved in. I'm not saying that it's something that is transferable to other um, land grant institutions, um, but I think that it offers some really interesting ideas in terms of the role of uh, universities in engaging with decision makers and communities um, in advancing uh, complex issues. So I'm talking to you about the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance. What this slide shows you um, down over a little bit on the left is the website, which uh, you can learn a lot more about this alliance. Um, I, um, so just to take Rosina's um, reference to a network of networks. So um, lots of folks have tried to name what this alliance is over its 10 years of existence. And people like to call it a cross-sector collaborative or a boundary spanning organization or a collective impact model. And we've chosen to try to not name it something. Um, however, I think the best thing to explain that it is, is a network of networks. So it's um, almost 60, actually a little bit more than 60 diverse organizations from around the state of New Jersey that have come together since 2011 uh, with the stated intent as um, indicated in this mission statement <clears throat> of working together to inform science informed state and local climate strategies, actions, policies um, here in New Jersey, both with regard to climate mitigation as well as uh, climate um, resilience. Uh, the organization came together, uh, we pulled together a, a convening of, of leaders in New Jersey in 2011, brought in lots of experts to talk about climate change impacts in the state. And what came out of that conversation was this concept that, um, we, if we can bring together well-intentioned people, and if we can uh, bring to them the science and evidence associated with climate impacts to our state, regardless of whether those impacts are public health impacts or whether those impacts are economic impacts, uh, impacts to communities, if we can do that, bring together the science and the evidence um, and bring together well-intentioned, thoughtful people that those that process that model can lead us towards equitable sustainable and evidence-based solutions and in fact the work that we've done 
Um, Marjorie Kaplan is my uh, co-facilitator <clears throat> of the Alliance. The work that we've done has really sort of pointed to um, some very tangible outcomes here in New Jersey, and I'll walk you through them in a minute. What's interesting, I think, about the Alliance model is that when we first formed in 2011, um, all of these different stakeholders and thought leaders, some were legislators, some were executive branch folks, some were um, local officials, uh, some were community-based organizations, um, identified the idea that the last thing that we needed in the state was yet another 501c3 to work on this topic. What we really needed to do was to bring together the diverse voices of all these sectors that are gonna be affected by climate change. So whether that's, again, transportation, utilities, um, community-based organizations, environmental justice organizations, public health organizations, we needed to bring them together, create a safe space for them to have difficult, complex conversations about impacts and solutions. And we needed to be able to intersect those conversations with science and evidence. And so this concept of a network of, net, of networks emerged. And at the time, many of these leaders asked the university if it could serve a facilitation role. The, having the university serve that facilitation role really infuses this concept of science and evidence in that um, Marjorie and I serve to take this group of 60 organizations and work with them to be able to bring evidence to bear to inform their conversations. We like to say that this is a group that, um, you know, when you, the concept is that when you take well-intentioned people and give them evidence and give them science and donuts and coffee and close the door, maybe lock the door, you will arrive at um, solutions that make sense. And um, let, we'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done. And um, I'm categorizing these into sort of five areas of, of work or uh, achievements, I guess, from the Alliance over the course of the last decade, decade-ish, we'll say. So the first area of focus for the Alliance is examining, not advocating, we're not an advocacy organization, but examining options for policy at the state and local level and, and policies that um, can point to um, science, can point to evidence in terms of what works or what doesn't work in other places. So I'm, for each of these five categories, I'm gonna just give you a couple examples. So here's one where we did a lot of work um, with folks in, um, in our human ecology department to look at what are some of the impacts of climate change uh, projections here in New Jersey on the water supply sector. Uh, and then we also looked at what are some examples of how uh, other states have moved forward in addressing these kinds of impacts and intersecting planning for climate futures into their water planning. Uh, on the left, you see uh, an op-ed that was written based on this work by former governors Kane and Florio. Uh, those two gentlemen are the honorary co-chairs of the Alliance, and they're much more than honorary. They're actually very active, as evidenced by the fact that they wrote this opinion piece pointing to policy solutions to address water um, impacts from climate change. Uh, here's two other examples. Uh, both of these were not actually done on behalf of the Alliance. However, the Alliance served as a diverse stakeholder group to inform this work. On, on the left is an overview of, um, of state coastal zone management policies to address sea level rise. In this case, we looked at policies in 15 other states to look at uh, what possible policies might um, be transferable here into New Jersey, how is science used to inform that, um, and what are some uh, uh, authorities uh, and legal mechanisms that New Jersey could explore. And this work is actually uh, uh, tangibly informing uh, decision making here in the state right now. The Alliance in that case served as a stakeholder group to give input to the researchers. On the right, similarly, um, the university uh, undertook work to look at uh, how is New Jersey doing with regard to its 2050 greenhouse gas emissions limit? How far are we to the, to the limit? How far are we to the goal? And what are some options for looking at um, policies in the state that can help us to 
uh, get to that 2050 limit. Again, in this case, the Alliance also served as a stakeholder group and also did a lot of communication on the outcome um, of that work. The work was completed just prior to the incoming uh, Phil Murphy administration and the timing was done specifically to be able to inform an incoming administration and has really sort of helped to kind of set the pace in uh, some policy work in this space. The second category of work of the Alliance is developing actionable tools um, and information. One of our featured tools, again, these are Rutgers products, but the Alliance has been able to be the stakeholders to inform this work, as well as quite frankly, by being able to present as um, a, a collaborative, uh, be able to bring in resources uh, to have this work done. So what you see here are several of our data visualization and mapping tools. Several states have these where um, end users can go on and they can map climate futures to whether that's sea level rise or precipitation and look at it in terms of impacts to assets and communities, um, to populations. So uh, this is work that, that is ongoing um, with the Alliance serving as the stakeholder group. This is another example. So um, you might not think of a public opinion survey as an actionable tool, but I do because what we were able to do was we conducted um, a, a public opinion survey here in New Jersey with the Eagleton Institute, um, at, which is a, a, a survey uh, center here at the university. And <clears throat> by doing this, what we were able to do is we were able to give this really important information to decision makers, such as legislators. So we could say something to them like, when we survey New Jerseyans, which uh, we did, this survey was last year, we can see that 75% of New Jerseyans are concerned or very concerned about climate change, but only a quarter of them know how to prepare, right? So a statement like that is, is, um, has been very important and very helpful in terms of helping decision makers to start to understand uh, what kind of um, actions and policies are needed in the state. The third category of work of the Alliance is on outreach and education. Um, this includes, producing um, materials that are helpful to targeted decision makers like um, legislators, like executive branch um, uh, appointed officials, like local officials, but it's also um, outreach and education that we've done for the general public. So climate change 101, or who are the populations most vulnerable to climate change? So it's not just um, developing materials though and developing videos and really great um, information that anyone can use, whether you're a school teacher or a reporter. A lot of our work has also um, involved framing issues and that's been very important here in New Jersey. Um, a couple of the items up here you can see on, on the screen, the addressing climate change is a monumental opportunity and populations vulnerable to climate change are things that I would characterize as things where the Alliance has helped to frame these issues. Um, so the concept that climate change is, um, we could look at it if we wanted as a doom and gloom thing, right? But uh, the Alliance chooses to frame it as a monumental opportunity a monumental opportunity to build equitable, resilient, healthier communities, or a monumental opportunity to create um, sustainable green jobs, right? So, so that kind of framing has been important and has really sort of taken off. Um, prior to the Alliance's work, uh, say nine years ago, um, the concept, the, the language in New Jersey about uh, climate change and impacts on populations was really sort of this sense of um, affluent white people on the Jersey Shore, right? Um, and so based on some work that we did, analytical work that, that the Alliance did using um, work from Susan Cutter at the University of South Carolina and the Centers for Disease Control Social Vulnerability Index, we were able to really document um, what popula populations are really most vulnerable in the state. And in that way, we were able to frame the issue, frame the issue again, that we're talking about uh, people in our state who are most vulnerable, because they're living in cities, because they don't, they're not affluent, they may be low income or living in poverty, people of color um, and, and others. Um, we also, in terms of outreach and engage, education, have done a tremendous amount of two-way stakeholder engagement. The report on the top right is work that we've done engaging with the public health community to listen to stakeholders about what some of their needs are, challenges, opportunities, what kinds of tools do they need? 
And then finally, most and most recently, this um, little graphic on the bottom right is our most recent um, big convening. Um, over the last 10 years, we've had several big, huge uh, conventions and conferences and convenings. This year, of course, they're being virtual. And, um, and for each one, we've been able to present the work of the Alliance to the public. The fourth category of, of uh, how the Alliance focuses its effort is on linking scientists and other experts to decision makers. Now, the report that I have up here is one that was issued just this past December. And this is um, a, a report where Rutgers University uh, under the direction of Professor Clint Andrews and Professor Bob Kopp pulled together a uh, science panel to articulate consensus science regarding coastal hazards here in New Jersey and to inform a, a planning framework that could be used by decision makers in New Jersey to accommodate future uh, climate projections with regard to coastal hazards. The work that led to this, and the only reason I didn't post that first report that the Alliance did was because the cover is not as jazzy as this one. But so this work was originally done by the Alliance in 2016 in partnership with Rutgers University, not with, with government. This, this 2019 report was a follow-up to the original Alliance work where the Alliance said, someone needs to convene the scientists to tell us what it is we can expect in, ter in terms of coastal hazards and how can we take that science and frame it in a way that can inform decision-making. And so the Alliance led that effort. Um, here's one other example of how we've been able to link experts um, to decision makers. And this is where um, the, Al the Alliance <clears throat> worked with the Centers for Disease Control um, through their BRACE framework and the, the um, Climate Ready States and Cities program. New Jersey is not currently a participant in that program, but CDC was gracious enough to allow the Alliance to participate in their conversations. And so their technical guidance was used to allow the Alliance to do a New Jersey climate and health profile report, which is where we were able to take the current science using Rutgers science generally and overlaying that with challenges to public health. Again, we were able to frame the issues here in terms of who's most vulnerable and we're able to outline policy solutions as part of the collaborative conversation of all those different diverse stakeholders that participate in the Alliance. And so many voices came together to offer recommendations on a climate change and public health agenda for the state. And then finally, um, I think the overarching value of the Alliance um, is that the Alliance creates this forum where 60 plus organizations from all different sectors come together and uh, exchange not just what they're doing, but where they see the challenges to be. And so he here's a couple examples of some very specific work that's been done. So on, on the left, you can see that some of the follow-up work that's been done here in New Jersey is uh, an additional convening after that climate and health profile report, where we brought together stakeholders from the environmental justice sector, the, sector, the social justice sector, social service agencies, social work agencies, along with environmentalists, along with decision makers and others to talk about the intersection of climate change as an exacerbator of health inequities in the state and looking for opportunities to create solutions that, um, that bring um, those uh, intersections together and use climate change decisions, policies, and strategies as a way to help address health inequities. And so that convening has a report. The Alliance is doing work in this space now. Up on the top right, you can see the letters HIA, which is where the Alliance took some of the ideas that came out of that earlier convening that I just mentioned and did a health impact assessment, a rapid health impact assessment on New Jersey's draft energy master plan. The concept of health impact assessment is to try to think about what would the health impacts be or the health equity impacts be on a decision and to do that before the decision is made so we can then mitigate that decision to better improve health, particularly for populations that suffer from health inequities. And so in this case, the Alliance undertook a rapid health impact assessment on the draft New Jersey Energy Master Plan and offered those comments and that analytical work on the health impact assessment as part of the record uh, for comments during that energy master plan. And then one last example is, uh, and this is very recent, 
it, there's a lot of work happening in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic with regard to developing, and a lot of work is, of this work is being done by our Department of Marine Sciences here at Rutgers. And, and the concept here is what, what are the issues? What are the, how do we start to monitor the coastal and ocean ecological impacts of offshore wind? New Jersey has a highly aggressive offshore wind agenda. Um, and the governor has been you know, really advancing that agenda quickly. The question becomes, how can we have diverse voices come together and still advance those aggressive policies on offshore wind um, while making sure that we're monitoring ecological impacts? And how can we do that in a way where we can develop very specific recommendations coming from many voices to inform uh, uh, decision making here and now in New Jersey as to whether that's um, financial incentives for offshore wind developers, regulatory requirements and permitting. What are the things that need to happen now to make sure that as we advance our aggressive offshore wind program that we're um, undertaking the kind of benchmarking, bench line uh, data collection and continuing to collect those data into the future to monitor for offshore wind uh, potential ecological impacts. So one interesting thing that's kind of come from these conversations um, is that the Alliance has a very strong focus on equity issues. And if you read our um, prospectus um, or the overarching uh, guidance of who the Alliance is and how it operates, you'll see a very strong commitment to equity. And so uh, Marjorie and I work very closely with the Alliance. This uh, work was actually um, sponsored by the Climate Change Resource Center. But the Alliance um, was, again, a stakeholder voice as part of this, and many of those diverse voices in the Alliance participated. And this is where we hosted a forum um, that was to bring together voices on health, on demographics, on climate impacts, on social justice, to talk about um, something that um, a number of the morning panelists talked about, which is the intersection of three crises, right? um, issues that we're seeing now in our country with regard to historic racism and systemic racism, the climate crisis, uh, and then the COVID crisis, recognizing that the populations most hit hard here in New Jersey uh, from COVID are the same populations that are suffering from racial inequities and from climate change. And so this conversation we can see um, has really led to um, additional discussions within the state about how do we form policies and actions that allow us to really look at how can we um, think about climate as we're developing policies associated with uh, rebuilding and recovery after COVID and also looking at equity issues. So again, those are five examples, um, five categories of work. Um, just looking to see how I'm doing on time. I think I've got one minute. So just a couple of quick lessons learned that maybe can help inform this discussion. One observation is just last week, um, Kevin Lyons and I participated in a university forum uh, that was very similar in some of the discussions here. And uh, I can see from the participant list that there's some other folks um, who were at that forum, uh, that virtual forum as well. That forum was about how do we build collaboration within this university to be able to work with communities on advancing, um, looking at solutions to social determinants of health and health inequities uh, here in New Jersey. And so some of the same conversations came up in terms of what kind of incentives can we develop for, um, for our faculty and for our um, academics like me to be able to really focus on community-based work. What are, the, what are the features that make a university a good partner um, was a very big question. And how do we start to really build systems within a university to advance um, cross-sector collaboration to be able to support solutions here, um, here in New Jersey? So I just thought that that was really interesting. I'm not sure if that was recorded, but I did a PowerPoint with lots of suggestions. So there's lots of ideas there that we can build upon. And maybe there's opportunities uh, to intersect some of the things that came out of that with some of the discussion coming out of today. So just real quick, one minute, um, some of the lessons learned. And um, I know that we, uh, we have at least one faculty member participating um, in today's forum that every couple months uh, pings Marjorie and I to um, pull these ideas together into a journal article. And so maybe presenting them today and 
saying that out loud will hold us accountable to actually do that. Um, so some of our observations or our lessons learned from, from doing this for a decade um, is that the cornerstone of cross-sector collaboration, the cornerstone of bringing people together and having informed discussions that are based on science and evidence is trust. And building trust takes a lot of time. Um, and um, in our experience, building that trust with decision makers and practitioners and stakeholders, the university is very well positioned, particularly on these kinds of issues that deal with science and evidence and the need to really try to advance strategies and policies and systems that take science and evidence and, and move them forward as solutions. The university has an important role to play and the university is generally a trusted source by, by many of those partners. The university also has the opportunity to develop these kind of models that where we can work together with our partners. But these take a lot of time. And these are also things that, um, traditional research university-based uh, academic funders are not going to support, right? Um, uh, NSF is not going to support this kind of work in terms of us being able to uh, work with partners to, to take science done elsewhere and, and deploy it. And so it's always been a little bit of a struggle to be able to, um, to think through how do we make sure that this is sustainable uh, from a resource perspective and that the Alliance has the resources that it needs. And just ending on a, on a positive note, so I think one, uh, one way we've been able to do that um, in terms of being able to ensure that sort of sustainability, uh, because again, we're, we're 10 years in right now, um, has really been because of the role of the university and uh, the, the support that we've received from this university, whether that's from chancellors or from deans or from faculty, including uh, those that are participating in this conversation today, who have given lots of time without being funded um, to be able to, um, to help give input into the work of the Alliance, to support the work of the Alliance, to help feature the work of the Alliance, and really to be able to give uh, these these um, stakeholders that participate in the alliance, the time, the energy, the capacity that the alliance needs to be able to move forward, these kinds of cross-sector solutions at the state and local level um, here in New Jersey. So, um, oops, I'm sorry. I just as a reminder, that was my our sort of model. So, thank you so much. I hope that's helpful, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Robin. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Thanks for just giving us such an inspiring talk about all the fantastic work that you guys are doing. Um, I think I'm also one of those people who's been nagging you about an article. Um, so yes, our next speaker then is um, Joel Rogers. Uh, Dr. Rogers is the Noam Chomsky Professor of Law, Political Science and Public Affairs and Sociology at the University of Wisconsin. Professor Rogers is going to be speaking on incubating high road economic and social development. So thank you. Okay, and I'm sorry about that uh, technical mishap. And I hope it doesn't repeat itself here. Okay, can you all see that at least? Can people see yes, what I'm- Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, let me race through this in just 10 minutes. And again, apologies. Uh, I've got a full deck of slides, which is probably a mistake. I won't show you all of them. I, I share them with Marjorie and you get them at the end. But, but let me just uh, use the limited time here. Let me turn on the timer uh, to try to answer this question as I see it. Uh, how can you help right now if you're at a university? And I'm not gonna talk about administration or uh, faculty tenure changes or anything, but just stuff accepting where you are right now, what we, what can you do? Uh, and my suggestion is that you get involved in your communities to help them get on the high road, which I want to talk about for a few minutes, and then uh, get Rutgers uh, to join Rutgers and other universities, get your university wherever it is to join the Epic Network, where you've got a bunch of people at scale doing exactly that. So far, we've done about 1,700 projects, 275 cities. It's an incredibly efficient way to get this, this very good work done. Uh, so on the high road, uh, democratic capitalism, um, uh, given the constraints it puts on, uh, or given its definition in terms of property rights, puts obvious constraints on our ability to realize the 
values of equity and sustainability and democracy that everybody on this call holds dear. As I define those terms, equity simply means uh, providing everybody in your society uh, broadly equal access to uh, whatever necessary means they need for their self-development and flourishing, uh, which we certainly don't do, and doing all these things on a sustainable, sustainable basis. Sustainability means handing off this world to future generations in ways that do not diminish the possibilities of life there, uh, from the biosphere to their individual lives. And democracy simply means uh, uh, an ideal of self-rule with equal respect among the self-rulers. And obviously, democratic capitalism in all sorts of ways puts constraints on realizing those things. But within that, uh, there are uh, various different types of ways to make a lot of money uh, in this world. One, which uh, you can treat people like roadkill and the earth like a sewer and democracy is something to make fun of as you starve it to death. I'll call that the low road. Uh, the other uh, is you show a more respect for people and for that matter, nature, yeah, and try to, oh my God, is this doing this again? Hold on. Uh, and, and figure out ways to increase a place's multi-factor productivity, uh, including in your, uh, uh, in your uh, calculation of factors, natural capital, and then share the benefits of, of doing that uh, locally. High road is basically, and I'll call that the high road. High road, as I just said, is basically a way to use democracy to increase your multi-factor productivity in a place, and then, but but defining that productivity uh, correctly as including your natural capital, your non-renewable natural capital elements, and also measuring productivity not as output per hour, but value per unit of input. And if you do the high road, you can sort of get something which is uh, realizable within even a uh, competitive market uh, capitalist economy. But it's not, it's not easy. It takes work. And the natural default of this system is toward uh, different ways of doing things. For firms, the, the choice between high road and low road looks sort of like this. Firms can compete on lowering uh, commodity prices for products, uh, lowering the price uh, uh, the price point on products, which is, uh, uh, well, we'll talk about the, what that means in a second. Uh, the high road is basically competing on raising product distinctiveness and performance for which customers are willing to pay a premium. Uh, the high road, though, requires better trained and equipped workers, continuous improvement, a variety of other things. And because not all of this can be done outside of any individual firm, uh, supportive policy and a variety of public goods. So even though we know, and we do know this now, that the high road will in almost inevitably, no, indeed inevitably, lead to lousy jobs, punitive and oppressive labor relations, lots of environmental damage, and eventually the undermining of your democracy. And even though the high road uh, will get you a better society, we as a society have not made as a clear choice uh, what, uh, the choice that many societies have made, which is effectively to close off the the low road and begin the discussion of how to build a decent civilization. The choice for communities is also more or less straightforward. Uh, do you want to close off the low road, help pave the high road, enable those stuck on the first to roll merrily along the second or not? Uh, that's, you know, if the high road is as good as, as advertised and it is, why not? Why don't people do that? Well, because in the same way that firms don't maximize good societies, but maximize profit, uh, and don't even maximize productivity, uh, societies uh, are not uh, completely self-governing and, and our communities are not completely self-governing and making the high road choice, while certainly possible, requires a certain level of political courage, skepticism of a lot of economic nonsense that people imbibe all the time and some confidence in ordinary people. And all those attributes are not in uh, super abundant supply in America. It is certainly possible to measure the high road, low road stuff. And my center at the University of Wisconsin does this all the time with firms and business associations and states and counties and, 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 and advocates. Uh, you can measure it for firms, you can measure it for communities, you can measure how much they've achieved, and you can measure the effect of different policy interventions to achieve more. Uh, but there's no problem in measuring it. Uh, indeed, if you can distinguish the following two animals, you could probably distinguish a low road firm from a high road firm. And if those are not easily distinguishable, maybe these two are. Anyway, so it's easy to, to, to tell the difference. The, the hard work is actually getting to work to do it. 
that is very, very hard work. People have talked a lot about trust. I think the best way to develop trust is to do something hard in a defined project with other people. And for communities that decide to go on the high road, uh, uh, what they got to do is, is map in, in the ways that Kevin was suggesting their, their product flows and their assets and their liabilities and have a real sit down with uh, stakeholders to say, okay, we are not going to give you any more support for staying on the low road. We're going to try to do the high road. And then uh, an easy thing to, for communities to start doing is reducing waste, which is all over the place in, in American uh, economy. Here, for example, uh, consider the, the housing, transportation, utilities, and healthcare, uh, which together comprise more than two thirds of what the middle uh, quintile household spends. All those things, which take up huge amounts of, of money in the US and households, and which destructively interact in all sorts of ways, like our housing stuff interacts with our transportation stuff in terrible equity ways as people drive till they qualify. Uh, with the result that people in the second quintile typically spend in metro areas actually spend more on transportation than they do on housing, or, or sort of horrific civilizational result. All these things, though, can be provided much more cheaply at equally high quality. Uh, and there are lots of models of, of doing that elsewhere, which uh, people can begin to implement if they want. Uh, that's a, a recent uh, micro cow site, which gives you lots of suggestions on how to do that. And then you worked with a community to fix its governing in some way. And, and then also, you know, being more transparent, be more evidence-based, uh, involving the community in a variety of ways. And then finally, being a good fiscal steward, because this involves a lot of social investment and you're gonna need some, uh, some taxes or revenue to do it. Uh, and we suggest that, as you might imagine, doing that in a progressive way, if need be through progressive consumption taxes like Pagovian taxes on public debt. But let's move uh, to the other. Th all right, so so much for the high road. You can do it. Uh, it's, it's being done all over. You can get lots of technical assistance in doing it if you want it. It's very concrete. It does advance the, the general cause that's being talked about today. EPIC, though, is a way to begin to do that uh, easily. Uh, and uh, that's really the EPIC network. Uh, what is the EPIC network? Uh, it, EPIC network, by the way, stands for Educational Partnerships for Innovation in Communities Network. And it's basically an alliance of, or a network of oh, 60 plus uh, uh, universities, including the ones highlighted in the, in the Big Ten, in yellow in the Big Ten, but lots, there are more every day. And what they do is they try to use the UN uh, social development goals to frame discussions with communities uh, using the hybrid technique of reducing waste, adding value, capturing and sharing the benefits of doing both uh, uh, in communities around the world. Uh, if you don't know the SDGs yet, shame on you because it's the last time humanity, since the UN Charter that humanity agreed uh, universally on anything. Uh, and it's increasingly used as a way to measure uh, a regional economic sustainability performance. I give you the links there. Uh, and the EPIC model is fairly straightforward. You go to a, 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 a city or a, a community organization and say, what are the problems that are killing you that uh, you know are important, but you don't have capacity or bandwidth to solve right now on your own? And then you go back to the university and see professors who are teaching courses in those subjects see if the professor is willing to give students credit for working on, for working on that problem. And uh, voluntarily, of course, of course, of course. And then you go back to your, your community client or whatever and say, would this be of interest to you? And if they say yes, then you're on your way to doing some sort of deal. Epic by, by basically harnessing uh, the expertise of faculty and the fact that students are already taking these courses and, and the university or the students are already paying for these things saves a huge amount of, of money for communities. Uh, it does intentionally aim at improving communities. We don't uh, you know, take uh, clients that want to increase child caning or, or further pollute their environment. They are very much community identified, so they're a little bit different. And, and it, the basic point of EPIC programs is uh, is improving the community, not improving the um, the quality of the students' education. Although it certainly has that effect, but it's not like a service learning thing. It's not a charity; the cities have to pay for it. But what they're essentially paying for is the transaction cost engineer. And because all city problems are wicked problems that involve multiple causes. Uh, usually in these projects, you wind up getting a lot of students involved. Here's a typical engagement year with an EPIC program. 
but there's no reason for you to believe me. Uh, believe David Ward, uh, who's a very, very experienced observer of higher education, a longtime president of the American Council on Education, twice chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He really has seen, and I haven't seen anything that comes close to this in terms of its efficiency. Again, it's about 1,700 projects, about 275 cities. And again, you shouldn't believe me here. You should just go on the EPIC website, which you can do this way. I'll give you the address at the end. Go to the member commons, sign up, and, and kick the tires uh, to your heart's desire. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, that was a wonderful talk. And we, I, I realize we're just running about nine minutes over and folks in this Zoom world that we're in, folks often have other commitments. But I would like to just ask our three panelists, Jeannie, Kevin, and Joel, to just stay on for just a couple extra, a couple extra minutes because I want to just sort of bring us back together and, and pose a question that um, I won't, we won't be able to take questions from the chat. Some of them have been answered. Thank you to Kevin, who's been frantically typing. Um, but I just want to, you know, to kind of pull the day together and just, you know, we started the day with, you know, sort of this uh, recognition of we're in, a, we're in a situation of multiple intersecting crises, COVID, a racial justice reckoning, and of course, a climate crisis. And all three of you gave, you know, incredibly detailed examples and illustrations of things that are happening in your spaces. Um, and so I was thinking that maybe just as a way to sort of, you know, kind of conclude, if you could, if you're thinking about the, you know, the students out there who are sort of just entering this space, and maybe if you could give sort of, you know, as thinkers and doers, you could give a little bit of, you know, a couple pieces of advice for students to how do they get involved? How do they connect up with these issues? How do they start even? Just what's the, what are some first steps that they can take? Over the years, um, we've had the opportunity to um, work really closely with really amazing students here at, at Rutgers. And I think um, the first step is always just reaching out in this case to the two facilitators of the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance say, here's my interest, here's my resume, I'm willing to do you know, some, some work that might not necessarily be paid. Um, and um, spending some time just chatting um, you know, with us and, uh, and we just do this all the time. And once we get to know who the students are, what their interests are, where they wanna go, what skill sets they might need to develop. We really try to keep an eye out for opportunities for them to be engaged. We, we sort of feel like it's part of our, um, part of our mission. So, that, but you gotta initiate it. We don't know if you're there unless you hunt us down. Right. Great, thanks, that's great advice. Yeah, the only thing that I would add to that is that we have to uh, also include our students in the decision-making processes at the university as it relates to this topic. You know, we don't want to look at them as, you know, we'll, we'll make all the decisions and you guys basically have to follow wh whatever we decide. I think that that's critically important. Um, and then the second thing is just there are internships that we do off campus. That's like a big deal, but really turn up the notch on internships on campus, which is what I do. I basically have my students fill out the same internship documentation they do for working at a company. But guess what? We're gonna work on the campus and get our house in order. And that seems to be very popular to them. Great. And I, I, I would say two things. Uh, let me take the second one first. Uh, the second one is if you wanna be useful, there are a lot of people who need the skills that you are currently prepared or could very easily right now have uh, uh, who need to improve their communities right now. Uh, the whole point of the EPIC thing is to make that easy for students to access those very different communities. But every community is trying to, to handle these problems or every community is working one way or another. If you have their professors, they're adjacent to the students saying, oh yeah, yeah, I'm working on these 10 problems for these 10 communities. It just makes it much easier for the student to get involved. For the students personally, you know, and, and you know, I'm, you know, I'm older, you know, uh, old enough probably to be a lot of your grandfather. Uh, 
uh, don't give up. Um, you know, don't be daunted by the enormity of this world's grief. Um, just uh, try to stay humble and uh, be nice and, and get to work. Uh, you don't have to complete this work, but you don't have any uh, moral uh, excuse not to start it. And, and there are opportunities right now. And, and more positively, I, I think it's going to be or could be an incredibly clean, bright, wonderful future. I, I wish I was in your situation, actually. I wish I was 40 years younger than I am now because it's going to be so cool with the Internet of Things and clean energy and urbanization all over that's not run by a bunch of investment banks. It could be an incredibly beautiful, deep life. So get ready for that one. And, but be there, show up for that. Robin, one thing I would add too is that we've found over these, this past decade is that um, sometimes there are um, uh, funders, particularly philanthropists um, or private donors who have a particular interest in issues if they see that students are involved. And, um, and so we don't involve students because of that, but we have certainly taken advantage of it to, to make opportunities available for students that can be paid. That's great. Those are just some really inspiring words and kind of getting, you know, the future is bright and there's many opportunities to be engaged. So let's just wrap up. I just want to thank Kevin Lyons, Joel Rogers, Jeannie Herb, our speakers this morning. Also, I mean, our speakers just now and also our speakers earlier, Stephen Gavazzi, Lisa Gromlich, and Rosanna Birnbaum for just wonderful thoughts and counsel. There's going to be a recording made of the is, is ongoing recording of the event and we'll be posting that on the Climate Institute website for folks who might wanna access that. So then just on behalf of, of Tony Broccoli, the Rutgers Climate Institute, Marjorie Kaplan, the other organizers, Kevin and Bob Kopp, just uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and um, that'll wrap up, that'll wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, agape forever. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks.